pastoral port and agrarian history of Benin. Pastoral port.
Good evening, everyone. Welcome again to Penang Institute. Um, I'm Uiki Beng, the executive director here. My specs are at the workshop, so I can't really recognize most people here. You'll have to excuse me. I can read though. So, well, welcome everyone to an event that means more to Penang Institute than most of our other seminar come book launches. Uh, you'll, you'll get to know why in a minute. We are very happy to have Marcus Langdon here to be on stage with us today to discuss a highly interesting subject with us. Now with this book project, we initiate what I hope will be a long running series of books on different aspects of Penang history. We call the series Concise Histories of Penang. So this, this is the first in that series. Uh, in the beginning, I played around with the alternative title of Portfolio Histories of Penang, but gave that up for fear of it being easily misunderstood. Why I wanted the word portfolio was that I wished to create a series of history books on Penang dealing with issues that are potentially part of the state exco portfolio nomenclature. You know, portfolio, this, this portfolio, that portfolio, not, not your financial portfolios. <laughs> This first one in the series, subheaded an agrarian history of Penang, will be something policymakers in charge of land matters and of agriculture will have to read thoroughly. I hope anyway. We settled in the end for concise histories of Penang, and I'm glad to say that Marcus set a very high benchmark for this budding series. All of you who buy the book today, and the book is for sale here at almost 20% off, will quickly notice that, that high benchmark that Marcus has set. The book also provides a rather concrete path towards understanding Penang's role in the world of the East India Company, in the colonial history of the region, and very importantly, in understanding the nature of Penang society. Let me read a couple of paragraphs from the preface I wrote for Marcus's book before I hand the floor over to him. Um, this is to give an idea of what we are hoping to do with this series, right? This monograph highlights the surprisingly important role that Penang played in global agriculture over the last 200 years and more. In many ways, Penang functioned as a major spice island for the British Empire between the Napoleonic Wars and the Second World War. In reading about this aspect of Penang's history, the reader cannot but be drawn to recognize the rich regional and global influences that formatted the parochial and the national. The arrival of the age of nation states in Southeast Asia after World War II has tended to simplify and even erase whatever aspects of history threaten to complicate the narrow understanding of nation building so often mistakenly sought by so-called nation builders. The wealth of our past is what enriches the present. Impoverishing the past, in effect, undermines our ability to understand ourselves, our present situation, and our opportunities to create a rich future. Penang Institute, through this series, though strongly cognizant of the faded and disjointed nature of much of Penang's social, cultural, political, and economic history, is determined to save whatever can be saved of the Penang experience so that we may learn from it and ponder over its uniqueness. Let me now, <coughs> well, sorry. We are now proud to introduce this book to you and to the world. And we pat ourselves on the back for having chosen Marcus and this subject to kick off this very important book series on Penang history. Let me now hand the floor over to my old friend, Marcus Langdon. I don't, need, I don't think I need to introduce him except to remind everyone of his many contributions to the study of Penang history, most important of which are his tomes on Penang, the fourth residency of India, 1805 to 1830. So Marcus, welcome again to the Penang Institute stage. The stage is yours. OK, 
Okay, readjustment. Thank you very much, Dr. Oi. That was a very kind introduction. I can already tell that he's trying to get me to write something else. <laughs> buttering me up, they say. Welcome, everybody. So great to see such a big crowd at this time of day. It was a bit of an experiment, I think, uh, to, to hold these talks and so on during work hours. So uh, I was surprised that we got so many people to uh, give up their afternoon and come along. So thank you so very much. I'm, I'm very much humbled that so many people came. Right. So we have 238 years of uh, agricultural history to get through, so we, we'll, we'll crack on. So basically, we, let me start this thing. Uh, where are we? Okay. That was the title slide. Title slide. <laughs> um, so basically, when, when, when we think agriculture, we think food, right? We're feeding the population. And it's all about food. It's the way it's done which makes the difference. Basically, the two systems exist in this region. Of course, the big impact that the, the British had coming here was that they brought a capitalist system with them. And it really struck me when I was doing a lot of research for this book that, that you know, this is really the big impact that happened in this region. In a region where it's mostly subsistence or you, you sell a few things to make a little bit of money uh, just to get a few things to live day by day. Whereas uh, the British, the more capitalist system, they need lots and lots of money because they, they need to earn a revenue and uh, pay for their establishments and so on. So we, we can think of it like that. Um, it uh, was certainly became a capitalist system and continues to be so today, although I suppose there still are some pockets of self-sufficiency in parts of Malaysia. Just put my eyes on. Okay, so the old brain's not, not the way it used to be, so um, I'll be referring to my notes quite a bit. So basically, we, we, this map of, by uh, Popham, uh, 1798, could be 1791, was when he was here and charted it. We don't know if this date map was updated to 1798, but uh, that's an exercise still to, to achieve. But in 1785, before Light came here, he was helping the Sultan draft some sort of agreement for, with the Bengal government for the island. And in, in trying to convince them, he said the island is uncultivated, produces in its present state timber, dama, which is resin, rattans, wood oil, and tin. And it abounds with wild cattle, deer, and hogs, and has excellent water, a dry, healthy soil, and the harbor is well stocked with fish. So obviously trying to do a bit good sales job on, on Penang Island with the Bengal Council. Rice, cattle, and poultry were available from Kedah. So basically, I have to acknowledge that the, there was some prior habitation on, on Penang Island. Um, my own research, I don't believe there were that many on the island when Light arrived. He says 58, I tend to agree. But prior to that, there were up to 3,000 people who, who did live on a more or less a subsistence lifestyle. Piracy, as, a, as it's said, uh, which is why the Sultan turned them all out of the island. But when light arrived, uh, a food supply was the first concern. Well, if maybe the first concern was protection, so they started building a fort. But food, the food, getting a food supply was one of the major concerns because so many people started coming to the island quite unexpectedly, really. But within four years, Light could report that around one and a half thousand acres had been cleared and the island was already producing nearly 400 tonnes of rice annually. So this map, the area is coloured in green. I mean, you, you, you can see there the Penang Road, uh, Julia Street, 
Pakwa Street through here. So all of this was uh, paddy fields in those days, right? So it's quite swampy and, and, uh, and so hard to, hard to believe when you look at it now. But those paddy fields extended all the way out towards Tanjong Tokong and all the way down south towards Bayan La Pass area. Still, uh, all the rice that was grown on the island was only enough to feed the population and sometimes not enough and, was, and rice never became an export commodity. But what the island needed was this export commodity. So this uh, map was drawn in 1802 and basically shows pepper growing here. Now the EIC had uh, first really come to this region because of the pepper and then the nutmeg and cloves and so on. But pepper was the, the base commodity that was sought after. Uh, usually it was taken from the west coast of Sumatra. The EIC established a settlement in Bantam in Java in what, 1613, 1603, sorry. And uh, then they established their own settlement on the west coast of Sumatra in 1685. That was at Bengkulun or Bengkulu now. Uh, and that settlement lasted until 1824, providing pepper on the west coast of Sumatra. But Light very well knew the potential of this pepper trade and uh, sent GK, allegedly Kole Juan, to, to Aceh to bring back some live pepper plants. And 10 years later, there were 1.3 million pepper vines planted in Penang. So this map shows all those pepper regions in, in green. The green is very pale, I'm sorry, but it's an old map. Um, and the red areas are basically East India Company land. This area is Ie Tam, and this is where the EIC established the Botanical Garden, which we'll get to. But I just wanted to read uh, an excerpt from a magazine of a visit to a pepper plantation in the early 1800s. And this illustration accompanied that article. And I'm not sure how well you can see it, but it, it, it is about Penang. The sketches are all about Penang and shows all the various aspects of the pepper trade. And this visit was actually to Chike or Kole Juan's grandson's pepper estate. As we passed through his plantation on our way down to the seaside again, our path leads us through extensive flats, well leveled by artificial means, upon which in every stage of color from deep green to a dingy reddish brown, are countless pickles of pepper undergoing the drying process previous to being packed for embarkation. There are women and children carrying down basketfuls of the freshly culled fruit for the purpose of spreading it on these platforms. There are men, good connoisseurs, who are collecting the ripe pepper. There are more women and children exclusively employed in turning the fruit so as to expose all parts equally to the heat of the sun. Good day for it today. There are noisy Chinese coopers hard at work preparing small barrels to export the pepper in. There are garrulous Malay women making canvas sacks into which the pepper is first put before being packed in the barrels. There are screaming porters and bullock cart drivers clamoring amongst themselves about the proper loading of the bullock. There are turbulent native boatmen expostulating with angry English seamen under a broiling sun about a missing mark or number. There are bills of lading stating the good ship Lady Pepperpot has safely laden ever so many hundreds of barrels of pepper to be in good condition delivered to Mr. Spice's agents on the London docks. So it's a, a very lively sort of picture of the pepper trade and pepper became a huge, huge uh, industry. This is actually a picture of picking pepper somewhere in Singapore, probably in the later 1800s. Uh, there's only one difference between how it was grown here and in Singapore. They, in Singapore, they grew it on poles, which were put into the ground. In Penang, they grew it 
on live trees. So they would actually plant a fairly fast growing tree with the pepper vine and it would, would grow up the tree as it went. The, the trouble with the, with the pepper trade came not because it wouldn't grow, it actually grew extraordinarily well and was judged to be some of the finest pepper in the world. And they managed to produce so up to 10,000 tonnes of pepper in a year, but they couldn't sell it. And, and this is partly <laughs> one of these quandaries uh, where the East India Company controls the settlement and they control the shipping that comes here. Penang was established as a port or a petrol station on the way to China and for the ships. And really all those ships were stocked in England. They sailed all the way to China, delivered their goods, stocked up again and sailed back to, to the UK. And they were not allowed really to trade in between. They didn't have space or they, it, was, it just wasn't the done thing. The only people that could trade were some of the, the captain, a couple of officers who did a little bit of private trade on the side. So they couldn't use East India Company ships to, to ship the pepper. East India Company didn't seem to want to know about it. They wanted to keep continuing getting pepper from, from the west coast of Sumatra and supporting Ben Kulin. And consequently, Penang's pepper trade fizzled out. Um, there was a brief revival in the sort of 1820s and so on, but uh, it, it never really took off. And yet, you know, the perfect place to grow pepper and the perfect place to... to grow something that should earn a revenue. Beetle nut, uh, areca nut, um, Penang Island was named after beetle nut, so it, it, it was kind of a, a, a tree that was growing here, uh, but people still planted it in quite large numbers in the early days. The planters always diversified a little bit and had a few little plantations of, of all sorts of things. Uh, but beetle nut was an extremely good local product and a regional product. And there was an awful lot of regional trade with the beetle nut in, in, in large quantities. But beetle nut, they don't chew beetle nut in London. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's not an export trade. So as, as popular as it was in the region, uh, it, it wouldn't raise a revenue, you know. But still, uh, just to give you an idea of how they did it in those days, they often used Chinese um, to clear the plantations and plant the trees and manage them for two or three years until they started to grow and um, produce or, or whatever. But uh, they, those would work on contract at uh, 350 Spanish dollars for 10,000 beetle nut trees. And if you waited patiently and looked after them well, after seven years, your return would be approximately four times your investment on those trees. But they still needed a, a much better product for, for trade and it was the nutmeg and clove of course, locked up by the Dutch in the Moluccas for nearly 400 years. It was tied up. And, and uh, basically, the British only got their hands on it when French forces invaded Holland and the, the region of Holland escaped to England and then asked the Brits to take over their settlements in the east, South Africa, Sri Lanka, uh, Malacca, the Moluccas, to stop the French getting their hands on them. So this is what happened. And it, of course, it was like opening the gates to the treasure trove. The Irish botanist uh, Christopher Smith was the one who came here, suggested establishing a botanic garden in the Ayatam Valley that we were looking at before, and went off to the Moluccas and spent six years sending back live growing nutmeg plants from that size to, to this size. Unfortunately, only about two and a half percent of them survived. But along the way, enough plants were you know, sidelined off to, to other planters, local planters. And in 1805 or six, five, sorry, the, the um, botanic gardens were sold off on the orders of the, the Calcutta 
administration. It was a the trouble with nutmeg and clove, nutmeg takes 15 years to produce anything. So it's a very long it's a time to wait for, for a, a return, an, an unknown return, really. I mean, uh, although Penang was deemed a good place to grow the nutmeg, they didn't really clear the land properly. and uh, They cleared too much of the forest, whereas in the Moluccas, in the natural habitat, the nutmeg actually grows under a forest. So there were lots of mistakes made here. Nevertheless, um, Smith also sent some 35,000 other varieties, species of plants and fruit and uh, just uh, timber trees and all sorts of trees to Penang and is pretty much solely responsible for the diversification of uh, flora on the island. There are many of uh, Penang's fruit trees that we can trace back to Smith's shipments from the Moluccas. So as I'm sure you've seen this picture before, a uh, common picture of Glugor, where the university is now, uh, David, David Brown's estate. David Brown was the one who took a risk and bought a lot of the nutmeg plants and, and established them and then expanded all his grounds. Uh, and then his sons continued that on and they did reap a very good reward from that. Just before his death, he also planted 100,000 coffee trees and intended to plant three or four hundred thousand, but uh, passed away before that happened and nobody else seemed to have taken it up. But coffee, I've always thought, would, would have been a very good crop on the island. So at the same time that painting was done, uh, I thought I'd throw these little tables in because, you know, Penang Institute likes these things. So um, here we have... 1818, about a quarter of the island has been cleared for cultivation. And, you know, all those, all those names there, I've kind of used a more modern name than, than was originally listed there, but uh, it's quite surprising how much area was cleared in all those, all those parts of Penang. So this one, this slide, lists the other production other than nutmeg, clove and rice that was growing in, on the island in 1818. There's a bit of a census there. I'd love to know who counted the sugarcane. If you've ever seen a sugarcane field, <laughs> I've no idea how you count 74,000 sugar plants. Um, Pineapples also grew too, I should mention, in, in those early days. In, in fact, a lot of people don't know, but Gottlieb Road used to be called Pineapple Lane. It was sort of the end of the, the main settlement. And there was 300 acres under, under cultivation of pineapples in that area. Pineapple Lane. So Gottlieb Road. Used, used to be called Pineapple Lane because all on the hillside of the road was pineapple plantations, all the way, stretching all the way down towards Tanjong Tokong. So the, the third uh, chart here is quite a, quite a fun one in a way because all of you that are over 40 years of age are aged. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, it w this census was actually done to find out how many active people there, there were on the island that could be employed or, or are going to have children to produce more workers, that, that sort of thing. So they were looking for how many people are available to work the plantations on this 16,500 acres of land that's been cleared. And out of out of all of these, the, the, the age population there is 20,000, but out of those, they estimated it would only be about 5,000 people that would be available to cultivate that land, uh, which equates to one person per 3.3 acres. So this was always a, always a problem in those early days. They, it, it, it's before they used to bring in a lot of additional overseas foreign workers.
So this, this map here is 1820. Um, it very quite accurately shows all the various districts of Penang Island. But the main thing I've put it up here for was just to show you the province Wellesley strip of land, which was taken in 1800, uh, ceded to the East India Company as a strip of land to protect uh, Kedah. And, and the benefit to Penang was that it provided extra land on which to grow crops and so on. So the original, ooh, why is that so blurry? Is that blurry on that one? Is there a focus thing or what? something's gone out there? Should be a lot, cross, lot sharper than that. Anyway, okay. Um, there are quite a few little, this is uh, 20, uh, 1820, right? So there's quite a few little villages uh, scattered along through Province Wellesley. All these little patches are actually villages. Um, paddy fields, it, it shows paddy fields in this area here. Uh, but the boundary to Province Wellesley, as it was first seeded, is, in, is down here. It was just three miles wide, stripped parallel to the coast. The expansion has happened since then. So when uh, 1821, Siam invaded Kedah, and thousands and thousands of Malays flocked to Sebrang Prai, and that was the beginning of a bigger rice industry in Seberang Prai. It took some years before it started to establish, but uh, it became a bit of a rice bowl after that. And still is today. We can still see those rice plantations in more or less the same areas that they were established in those days. So the next big kind of crop that came along was sugar. The Kedah Malays had actually grown sugar for centuries uh, and just processed it in very small uh, manual quantities. Uh, by 1835, James Lowe was a su superintendent in, in Province Wellesley, estimated there were about 2,000 uh, small plantations there, mostly run by Chinese. Uh, and, you know, again, on a fairly basic sort of manual process, they, they produced uh, clayed sugar which gives you an idea of the process. Before that, it, it, it was really not very profitable for the Brits or the planters here to take up growing sugar on a large scale because the mechanization wasn't available. But as it became available, the sugar industry started to take off. Again, the, the, the Brown family the first, were the first ones uh, who established a sugar plantation with a mill on the Otahiti estate, which was in Aitam, just to the south of the Aitam township. And <clears throat> they grew sugar there and uh, they managed to produce a very good uh, high quality sugar uh, using a mill drawn by water, driven by water, sorry. So that was 1838. Then as, uh, as the 1840s uh, crept on, uh, more people started to grow sugar. Uh, and Thomas Bacon was the first European to establish a, a farm in Province Wellesley, about a thousand acres up in the, in the Northeast. And uh, he imported the first steam driven mill. Uh, and these are a big fancy affair as we'll see in a picture, uh, brought in generally from Scotland. By 1846, there was 500 acres of uh, sugar growing on Penang Island, you know, all around that Paya Terabong Valley area, uh, feeding the Otahiti estate mills. And that's something that doesn't really pop up in Penang's history. By 1850, most of the southern area of Province Wellesley had been bought up by Europeans and this is where we get all those familiar estates, you know, the Jawi and Valdor, Victoria, Golden Grove, Caledonia, all these sort of big estates came up in the south. There were a smattering of uh, sugar estates in the north as well. So this, this uh, map was uh, 1853. I'm not sure why it's all so blurry. 
Does it look blurry to everyone? Anyway, um, 1853, uh, this, this map shows all the sugar estates and uh, rice plantations on the Province Wellesley side at that time. And in that season, there was, they were producing 4,000 tonnes of sugar and nearly three quarters of a million litres of rum as a byproduct from Province Wellesley. So it created an export business, but again, they were a bit thwarted by London because they wanted to impose taxes and duties and all sorts of things on them. And it took some years of uh, legal argument to, to get them to drop the duties uh, to make it viable for Penang to export sugar to, to Britain and Europe. So this is the uh, one of these huge big uh, sugar mills oh, when it comes up. It stopped. There it is. This is one of the big sugar mills. This is 1863, uh, early photo by John Thompson, one of the early photographers in Penang, not the earliest. At this time, there had been a lull in the whole sugar industry, a bit of a recession, and uh, you know, the, the about half a dozen of the huge estates were bought up by a British MP, uh, Edward Horsman. Uh, so, so it became a viable investment for people from Britain to come to buy into these estates, and that's how much money was being generated from the sugar industry at that time, and of course the rum. This is the famous Batu Kawan sugar estate, uh, one of the canals. These canals were actually uh, mostly, mostly dug by the Chinese as well under contract. Um, they had a system they call Ruma Katil, so the small house where they'd take a big estate and divide it into little sections and each section would have a contractor and that contractor would have the number of workers, uh, you know, according to the size of it and, and that they'd be responsible for developing that uh, area of the estate. So they ended up getting huge areas cleared and established uh, in, a, in a very simple fashion, all under, all under these contracts. Interesting, it was all the, mainly Chinese at the time. So some people might know this uh, gentleman standing over here on the left, he's James Montague Bent Vermont. The, he was uh, allegedly larger than life in all ways. And uh, when he died, he was a member of the Legislative Council and so on, a big voice around town. And uh, when he died, they built this fountain on the Esplanade, which sadly no longer exists. So, he's blurry too. <laughs> Right, so tapioca was actually one of the other crops that was grown on a reasonably large scale up in the north of Province Wellesley, started in 1856 by Robert Wilson on the Alma Estate. It's a familiar name. Uh, and then another fellow, Leopold Chassereau, uh, developed them on the Ayarendang and Malakoff Estate, sort of down towards the middle area of uh, Province Wellesley. So by 1864, the Singapore Free Press could report that the quality of the tapioca produced was so good that Penang became only second to Brazil in its export of tapioca. So it became a, a huge, uh, in huge demand. And not, not a very expensive crop, quite a simple process to, to harvest the tapioca and you know, clean it off and dry it out and grind it up. So by 1854, these stats are just Penang Island. We can see that about half, nearly half the island had been cleared by this time. And 46% and of what was cleared had been cleared for spices. So we're going to revisit the nutmeg. Because by the early 
1840s, there were 420 nutmeg plantations just on the island uh, and clove plantations as well. The cloves were never quite as prominent as the nutmegs. They didn't grow as well and the nutmegs uh, were where the money really was. But these uh, estates tended to run from even one acre to a thousand acres and uh, our hills that are nice and jungly now were not nice and jungly at that time. They were all kind of cleared and terraced and uh, for these nutmeg plantations. So by around the early 1840s, they were already producing 18 and a half million nutmegs. I'd like to know who counted them too. So the growth of nutmegs paralleled the growth of sugar. So by this time, Penang's developed quite a nice little income earning revenue and uh, things are looking quite good. By 1860, exports for the year were 382 tonnes of nutmegs and 125 tonnes of mace. If you know how light mace is, I, I can't even imagine how much 125 tonnes of mace would look like. But around, the, around 1860, it started in the 1850s, a, a, a root fungus started to spread through the nutmeg plantations in Singapore and ended up in Penang as well. And the entire, the entire nutmeg uh, plantations were wiped out. It's, it's a, a lesson of monoculture, you know, and, and the way they, they grew things, there were lots of criticisms about how they'd manured uh, too much and created the fungus and all, all sorts of reasons. But uh, it was, it was a, a very rapid uh, end to the, to the nutmeg industry. Uh, there were nutmeg trees brought back in at later date and, and people started to grow them. And by 1882, uh, Koh Siang Tut uh, was the largest nutmeg grower in Penang with around 12,000 trees uh, planted on terraces. But it never regained uh, that early impetus and uh, the, the large revenues that it was earning. So everybody gave up and thought, well, we're not going to plant these fussy old nutmeg things again. Let's stick in coconut trees. And it's quite interesting because by 1874, you see 17,000 acres, 25% of the island, pretty much the same as it was the, the nutmegs, uh, is all now coconut. In the early days, 1802 or so, they were quoting that uh, one could earn a, one Spanish dollar tree, uh, per tree annually from the coconuts in 1802. Um, the statistics don't really seem to be there as to how much people were earning from coconuts in the later years, but uh, I suspect not huge amounts from, from the whole nut themselves. That money came from copra, which is the hardened flesh, which they split out of the nut. And then that copra is sent off to uh, make coconut oil in the main, but is also shredded up for, you know, desiccated coconut and all sorts of things like that. But the coconut oil became a whole industry of itself. These photos are around 1910. Probably this is, this one I know is uh, 1906, loading coconuts on the ships off Penang. And this one over here is, is the uh, cracking out the copper from the nuts. It's probably around the 18 early 1920s. So the pioneer of this large-scale production of coconut oil was Pua Hin Leong, who is colloquially known here as the rice miller. And he constructed these, uh, the Ki Heng Bi rice and coconut oil mills in 1900 in, on the banks of the Sungi Penang. And this, this photo is actually of of those, uh, of those mills. The powerful steam-driven machinery imported from Britain could produce 60 tonnes of clean rice and six tonnes of coconut oil in 12 hours. So, you know, when a factory's running all the time on a daily basis, we're talking about a, a big quantities of uh, these products. The rice, again, was... Um, generally for local consumption, 
and was quite often imported from other areas, even from um, Java, uh, uh, Burma, and, and certainly from Kedah and other areas. So more mills opened, more coconut mills opened in Penang, and by the 1950s, they were responsible for around 40% of all Malayan coconut oil produced and exported from Malaysia, or Malaya at the time. Now Malaysia has to import coconuts. It's a sad fact. Even for Taipu Sam, they still crack the coconuts, but they have to get them brought in. So other oils such as uh, sesame and linseed oil were, were produced on a small scale, um, generally by uh, Indian families running these, these uh, cattle mills. And, and these, are, these were quite prevalent in Penang and uh, somebody told me that you can still find them here and there. I don't know if anybody knows of any. It'd be fascinating to, to know if they're still running any like that. And then along came rubber. So Henry Ridley is this guy on the left here. He brought the rubber seeds into Malaya in 1877. But nobody was really interested. They were all focused on what they were doing already and didn't want to try and plant something else that might die off. So it took nearly 20 years really to get production underway. By 1895, there were still no commercial product, uh, plantations of uh, rubber in the whole of the Malay Peninsula. But the, the first rubber grown in Penang was from seedlings given to Charles Curtis, the superintendent of the Botanic Garden here by Ridley uh, around 1890. And it was first tapped for rubber in 1896. So this is a very early tree. Uh, and, and the caption on it says, the oldest para rubber tree in the Straits. But I think uh, Taiping or, and uh, a couple of Kuala Kangsa and places like that might have a dispute with that, but uh, because there were trees grown in all these settlements as experiments. But we can say that the, Batang, Batang, the Penang Botanic Garden, uh, you know, had one of, the, one of the first rubber trees tapped in, in Malaysia. Ten years later, there were 13 million rubber trees planted in Malaya. So around 1906, and the Bertam estate in northern province Wellesley was one of the first to plant rubber. Uh, it was established by the Logan brothers uh, and uh, produced the highest quality prize winning rubber in the straight settlements when they submitted it in the annual competitions. Another first for the Penang. By the end of the 1920s, uh, Malaya was producing 50%, 56% of the world's rubber. The problem with it came with stockpiling of uh, rubber, especially in America and Europe, and, and we end up with the same problem that we have with oil, but there was no cartel at the time. so. What did they do? They actually introduced the cartel and controlled the price of the rubber and brought it back into line. So, you know, rubber was still remained a big uh, area of production for, for Malaysia, Malaya and Malaysia. Uh, even in 1988, uh, the production of rubber hit a peak of 1.66 million tonnes, but has uh, declined since then to around half a million tonnes. Uh, which represents less than 3% of all exports. Palm oil, on the other hand, of course, uh, experimental planting commenced in Selangor in 1917. So it was a long time ago when they started this palm oil business. Uh, as of 2020, there's 14 and a half million acres of oil palm in Malaysia. And it accounts for 37% of all exports. The, the concerns, of course, with all of these things, and here we see rubber, even the destruction, environmental destruction that rubber uh, you know, had on the Malaysian in, uh, environment, 
uh, and palm oil, of course, it's a, a global concern now of, of the environmental uh, issues around uh, the growing of rubber, of growing of uh, palm oil. And of course, there is still that risk of monoculture. If something went through the palm oil like it did the nutmeg, Malaysia would be in big trouble. How am I going? Nearly, nearly, nearly at the end. Labor is a very big topic here, and uh, in the book I talk about some of the different labor systems and so on that were, were around at the time. The people always ask, what about the slaves? Yes, there were some slaves that were brought over, not very many in the early days, but the East India Company was one of the first in the world to abolish the use of slaves in its own departments and tried to spread that to the whole island, uh, which took many more years to implement. However, uh, convict labor was brought over from India. Um, actually, there were, there were Indians that were sentenced to transportation as part of their sentence. Uh, for, for many Indians, it was deemed to be worse than being jailed for life to be sent for transportation away from their families and their country and everything else. So likewise, in Penang, uh, criminals were convicted and sent for transportation back to India. And, but it would be to Bombay or somewhere on the other side. So we, the convict labour tended more to uh, be employed on building roads. The, the, it was graded actually into five different categories of uh, convict and some worked in people's houses. Uh, some worked for the government in their government departments. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the tough gang were put to work on, the, on building roads. So a lot of Penang's roads were initially constructed by convict labour, not so much the buildings around the place. So uh, mass importation of workers from China was really, really commenced in a big way when, with the tin mining operations when they geared up. And of course, the Indian workers came in large numbers as the sugar, coconut and rubber plantations expanded. Uh, so there's, there's some good information about the book and in, in the book about the uh, various schemes. Pula Jarajak actually became a quarantine station which saw around one million migrant workers pass through the island en route to the sugar, to the rubber plantations and so on, and the tin mines. Even in 2020, there are around 2 million migrant workers in Malaysia, and 22% of those are in the agricultural sector. But I read the other day, they're still screaming for foreign workers for the agricultural sector, including rubber. All right, we're getting to the end. So this map is an 1954 map showing agricultural areas on Province Wellesley and on Penang Island. So the red areas are actually the urban areas at the time, 1954. The, the dark green areas is rubber. So you can see rubber actually grew in large plantations all over the island as well. Uh, yellow is rice, and that pattern of rice in Province Wellesley, particularly in the north, is virtually identical to what it is today. And if we jump to 2021, we see quite a change. The agricultural areas in, in the 2021 map are, are the pale, pale green areas. So, it happens all over the world, you know, the best land, the flattest land, the most fertile land ends up getting covered in housing and, and it's something that uh, I think humanity made a big mistake over. So the same thing we can, we can look at here for Province Wellesley. I'm sorry these ones on the right are so small, um, but uh, at least they give you a little progress uh, of, of the uh, growth of urban areas, even in province Wellesley, and the shrinkage of agricultural areas. And basically, the, uh, the rice growing areas here and the rice growing areas here, pretty much, pretty much the same. So 
I think there's a concerted effort to preserve these. So Penango should be very proud, I think, of the agricultural firsts that were generated on this little island. Grew some of the best pepper in the world, grew some of the best net nutmeg, the best mace, the best cloves, even though they were in small quantities, the best tapioca, the best coconut oil. It began a sugar industry which lifted the economy out of recession in the 1840s and on towards becoming a global export hub for Malayan produce, including tin, rubber, copra and coconut oil, tapioca, sago, coffee, cocoa and Sumatran tobacco, just to name a handful of the principal ones. Penang Port today, of course, uh, remains a major export hub for the shipment of goods from Malaysia and southern Thailand to the world. Aquaculture is looming as a new industry, provided they can uh, control the environmental damage that comes along with it. And Penang has a, a vision, the Penang 2030 vision, which aims to increase agriculture through urban farming and other alternative means. Um, it's quite an idealistic idea, but it would be nice to see it come to fruition. And I think uh, with, with that, I, I can say that uh, Penang continues to be an agricultural island, even though its area for agriculture has been vastly diminished. So I'll end there. I think I've overstayed my time. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, Marcus. Um, we'll now start a panel discussion, and I've asked a colleague of mine, Professor Zulfiga Yasin, who's our in-house expert on environmental issues. So, um, Prof. Zul, could you join us on stage, please? Yeah? A hand for Prof. Zul. Where do you want to start? Yeah, Marcus? Yeah, thank, you. <laughs> thank you, Marcus, for a very uh, exciting uh, historical rendition of Penang's uh, past. Uh, I, I read the book again yesterday in preparation for today, and uh, it struck me again how by, by looking at the growth of agriculture and, and how Penang's agricultural fortunes were tied to import and exports, uh, and it, it was quite clear that Penang, Penang is very much a creation of glo modern global trade, be, be it in agriculture or later, as we know, since 1970 in electronics. Um, and I think going forward, the state government is thinking perhaps even in services, we can be a global hub of some kind. So that, there's a certain logic to, to the development of Penang and it, it's... The global connection is quite obvious, right? So Penang without the global connection would probably mean that it's, it'll be a sleepy island of little consequence. I, I don't know, it's just my, my idea of it. But um, Prof. Zul, is there anything you would like to say to... Uh, Thanks, Sherry. Thanks, Marcus, a wonderful talk. Um, uh, looking at the, that pastoral profile that you painted today, most of it is um, uh, perhaps some cash crops. There's very little food crops apart from paddy. Uh, uh, and uh, for the cash crops, uh, presumably they are exported more regionally or are they internationally uh, exported? For, ex for example, I see beetle. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it's exported to Europe or maybe up to India. Uh, so what range of trade does the Penang uh, products uh, reach uh, during those periods? 
yes, thanks. Thank you very much for the question. I, I think the the talk. I suppose I should have qualified it by saying that I'm concentrating on the the agricultural items that could be developed to bring in a revenue. Um, so whilst there wasn't a lot of food, there was a chart there that showed all the other sorts of fruits and things. And of course, people grew all sorts of small crops and so on and food, food uh, products as well. But the international trade was what everybody wanted because even those landowners who started to grow them and the planters that came in, uh, they wanted a return for their money. In fact, the government wouldn't actually get very much of that and that's one of Penang's early problems being a duty-free port and keeping taxes and so on low was that they really didn't get very much revenue uh, but as far as exporting beetle nuts of course did go to India and uh, a lot went to China um, but not to Europe so yes the the idea of trying to get a, something that the Europeans really really wanted uh, was was the the golden ideal, you know? I mean, and that's where the nutmeg came into it because the Dutch had controlled the nutmeg so tightly uh, that nobody else could get a look in. And for the, the British to suddenly get the keys to the door um, was a great opportunity for them to establish a a, a place where they could grow the nutmeg trees, uh, you know, multiply it and export it to the world. And that was the idea of the botanic garden here in Penang. Unfortunately, it sort of got cut short, um, but uh, that, was, that was the plan, to break the Dutch monopoly. And even though the Dutch did get the Malaccas back again, um, they never really did quite uh, regain their total monopoly of spices. So, so I think Penang was kind of a, you know, it, it was the, the nutcracker that cracked the Dutch monopoly in a way, you know. Uh, but of, of course, um, sugar was also one of those products that was in big demand, but of course you're competing with the West Indies and other areas that are growing lots of sugar. So it, it, it did earn a good revenue, but, uh, and a nice, quick, easy crop to grow. Um, but in the end, rubber and so on seemed to be if, if you really look at it, you start with hard crops, they're difficult, they take a long time, and then it's, as it evolves, it goes down the line until we end up with palm oil, you know, you just stick it in the ground and go and collect all the fruit, you know. So it's, it's over the years, it, 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 it evolved into crops that were faster growing and cheaper and easier to grow. I suppose in all these crops that you mentioned, we, we're using a modern term, we're talking about supply chain, right? Mm -hmm. And in, in many cases, Penang produced the stuff, but then also the upgrading and then the value adding, especially in, in crops like sesame, for example. Mm -hmm. um, one, supply, one supply chain that Penang was very strongly involved in, I think is, is missing in the book, um, opium. <laughs> Uh, from what I know, Penang did play a rather important role along with Singapore, I think, in the in the uh, opium trade as well. Yeah, I mean, Penang, as I like to say, was a petrol station along the way to China, and and uh, and that was the case with opium. Penang didn't ever grow opium here; it all came from India. So um, they. A lot of people get confused when they read some of the old history of Penang and it talks about revenue farms. So it'll talk about the opium farm and, and, and various different uh, products, the, the, the alcohol farms and the gambling farms and all these things. But actually they were just monopolies that the government would auction to the highest bidder each year. Uh, the opium farm actually went for what would be equivalent to millions of dollars here in, in today's money every year. It was always Chinese who took the monopoly. And they would get the opium, import the opium from India, and they would have the license to process it into amounts that people would buy or use in, and distribute it around the place. So it was, there was a monopoly. So in, in fact, you know, while Penang, Penang played that part, being situated en route to these areas, 
uh, it, it never did grow opium. Yeah. Yeah. Someone from the crowd. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on the capital formation and the relationship between the large investment that took place, but of course also the, the working capital financing that went along with these uh, uh, various farming ventures um, along the way. I don't know whether you looked into that. Um, I, I mean, I, I suppose that really kicked in into gear with the sugar industry. Um, prior to that, it would have been it mainly local funding and so on. You didn't have overseas investment or big capital investments and so on. But once the sugar industry st took off, there, there certainly was a lot of uh, international financing involved. Uh, it, it, uh, especially with Britain at the time, the nutmeg, uh, sorry, the, the rubber industry was, was slightly different where it became an international affair and, and the Chinese became involved in it. And actually it, it, it became, there was a run on rubber in China around 1910. And the price of rubber was pushed right up in the shares and so on and all these banks and, in China were pushed way up and then it all just crashed in a heap. And uh, many, many banks went out of business and so on. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of international effect, if you like, from these these things, and and I guess uh, you know it only grew from there. So, uh, so you get that more that international investment uh, becoming a greater part of the Malaysian economy, right? And and relying on it. But uh, in the early days, it it wasn't wasn't really so. You know. Um, trying to give a little bit of uh, support to the question asked, I believe a very valuable clue come from the existence of uh, Standard Chartered. If I can remember right, Standard Chartered were initially uh, funding uh, province Wellesley in many of the ventures. Apart from that, um, Batu Kawan, as I can see from the uh, pictures, prompts me to think more along the French line connection where the two French brothers and Alma Estate were the early evidence of big capital for Province Wellesley. So I hereby have to check on the dates. Offhand, I think I may go wrong. So, but this capital, in other words, I can see a connection between early banking, French intensive capital, and of course, the various uh, Chinese merchant houses, including the Kua brothers, the Kobuan, Kobuan connection, who were so rich that he could support Raja Abdullah at the signing of the Treaty of Pankor. And also, he was the supporter of the fight for the Pankor uh, Ding Ding's. Uh, so I just like to share that. Thank you. Yeah, yes, I mean, you're, you're talking about the Chassereau uh, brothers in, in Alma Estate. I mean, obviously, they were, you know, foreign people who came that were independently wealthy, they'd actually come from the West Indies as well. As quite a few French planters came over to try their luck here and uh, help develop the sugar industry and, and, and develop the strains of sugar uh, into one that would grow the best here and produce the best Muscovado sugar and so on. But I think there were there was more independent uh, capital but you're right about Stan Chart, what about 1877, sort of came in here and, uh, um, you know, lending money and all the big banks followed, HSBC and so on. So, yeah, I mean, but, but, but that's 
getting into that uh, sugar and rubber industry when, when international funding uh, started to come to the fore. I mean, it costs a lot of money to set up a, a, a sugar estate with huge machinery like that uh, and bringing it in, importing it and setting it. That's just one little part of the whole sugar thing. So these, these estates weren't cheap to set up. So yes, yes. And, and a lot of people went broke. I mean, there was one, uh, the Penang partners, uh, several partners were in Batu Kawan. Um, uh, another one uh, was, um, was in partnership with George Scott. Uh, they basically bought up a number of sugar estates, but ex overextended themselves and the whole thing collapsed. And there was quite a lot of court cases in London over that. So, yeah, they, I mean, these things happen. Still do. Mm. Okay, I'm not aware of that one. I'll have to ask Mike. Any any other hand going up? Uh, I just got two questions. Can we um, think of durian as Penang cash crop? Uh, that's an interesting question. You know, this is something that I, that has interested me for some time because the, in the Christopher Smith records of bringing the nutmegs here, he lists all the, all the other fruit and so on that he sent here. I did give a talk some years back at the Botanic Garden about uh, all the fruit that I thought Christopher Smith brought here or I knew that he were introduced from him, some that I thought may were his, but were they here or not? I don't know. So it's very difficult to know exactly what was here early on, you know, when the EIC settled the island, what was growing already. We know there were fruit trees growing, it's written there, um, but what fruit trees? But the interesting thing actually was in that table that I showed too, that durian, very, very, very few trees. The same with all a lot of other fruits that we see today as like, oh, Penang fruit. But uh, actually, I think they're mostly introduced. I mean, you don't, if you think about an island that's uh, more or less natural island, um, you might find one or two sort of chempadak tree or something like that. But I'm not sure that you'd find great numbers of, of all, the, all the fruit that we now have in Penang, for instance. And the second question is connected yeah, to. Did you find any traces? of uh, records of land they sold to the Chinese early settlers that who own uh, coconut plantations, uh, rubber estates, or yeah. how did the British transfer those land to them? Oh, absolutely. I mean, right from, really right from day one, the Chinese were getting land. I mean, it was a origin, initially a, a free, free grant of land. Uh, but uh, as one person sold it to somebody else, you know, the, the sale of the, the title would pass with money. So land was sold from one to the other. But when we talk about even the uh, coconut plantations, uh, there, most of them were Chinese owned. The um, Chinese owned all the, sh all the coconut mills. Um, you know, I mean, it was, it was uh, mostly the Chinese growing. When it came to nutmegs, a, a great mixture. Everybody owned a nutmeg farm. Marcus, may I, may I ask, um, was timber ever an industry of any kind? Um, it, 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 Including it, coconut it, trunks? Not, not really an export industry. It was more, you know, I mean, there was a timber department set up by the EIC to control the cutting of timber very early on in, in the settlement. And, uh, of course, to provide timber for shipping and masts and all that sort of thing, but to provide timber for building houses in the town and things like that, but, but not as an export industry. Yeah. Luckily, probably. Well, thank you, Marcus. That was very interesting. And I've been like flipping through the book as you are talking and I, you know, the, the amount of digging that you've gotten into the uh, British history, historical records. 
is fascinating. Uh, but I, I do understand that your focus of this book was more in terms of uh, the contribution of agriculture to trade uh, and Penang as a port for, for export. But you did allude to the, uh, the issue of food security as well. And I was wondering whether if this book is, uh, will cover the agrarian history of Penang, whether or not you know, uh, there could be a bit more about uh, how Penang dealt with uh, food security. Like you mentioned, the paddy fields that were you know, in Penang and the little bit of Sabrang pride was not enough to support them. And then how, did, how was it that the uh, paddy fields were expanded and uh, I think in most cases, uh, the growing of rice is associated not with immigrant labour, but with local labour. And what had been the labour movement to bring in uh, paddy farmers, especially to these vast areas of province, uh, province Wellesley. And the other aspect of food security is in terms of uh, food crops like uh, vegetable farms and so on. And I was wondering, like, Penang used to have quite a lot of vegetable farms in lowland, like in, in even uh, Relao and in, uh, even Tanjung Tokong and all that. I was wondering where this uh, transition of uh, food crops like the, the spices and all that had changed into the kind of... Uh, agricultural land use pattern that you see now, both on the island and on the mainland. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, you'd find that even though the, the major crops took up major parts of uh, the agricultural sector, there were always those uh, vegetable farmers and so on. I mean, even light um, subdivided up parts of his Suffolk estate and, and uh, gave them to Chinese to grow vegetables on. And uh, he reported, you know, that it was very successful and there were lots of vegetables being uh, sent to the markets and so of, of Penang. But not as an export industry, but uh, I think all, all of the small cropping would have gone in parallel with the, with the large scale cropping as well. And uh, the evolution of that over time I suppose has uh, been pushed out more by by urban expansion than anything else, hasn't it? I mean, uh, most people here could probably recall the, the rice paddies down towards Bayan La Paz, and so on. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it, it's not that long ago that that those areas were still agricultural. Um, as for the the workers that did it, um, certainly the rice paddies was generally done by the Malays and uh, because of the invasion of Siam into Kedah in 1821, many, many thousands of uh, Malays fled to Province Wellesley and to Penang Island. And actually, strangely enough, that's when Malays outnumbered Chinese for the first time in Penang. Um, and of course on Province Wellesley. But, it, it, but, but basically it was a a blessing in disguise in some sense because then everybody could establish themselves in province Wellesley and start to produce cropping and so on for the island. So that's where a lot of the rice, these big rice paddies were all started and, and continued on. Um, not good for Qatar, of course, and not good for those people who couldn't return home. But, uh, you know, it, it actually still took, they talked about the frustration of... Uh, saying to the Malays who fl fled to Sabrang Prai, you know, start growing rice. You know, you, we need it, we need it. You can get a good income from this. But as I mentioned right at the very beginning, this is a subsistence farming kind of a, a mindset. Um, they're not thinking of producing giant amounts of rice to, to export or sell on to other people, you know. They're not, not, it's not part of the culture, right, to do that sort of thing, so. So that, that became the problem there. And I suppose the Chinese, uh, by default, took over in a lot of these areas uh, uh, as they were more inclined to be industrious at, at, at 
any given uh, chosen uh, occupation. And of course, the, the aim was to produce a lot more than they needed for themselves. Right? So it was definitely not a subsistence uh, mindset. Jeffrey Xiao and yeah, in the port city, that particular book, I would like to concur that Penang rice food security. I think the network as Penang port does not emphasize in any in history the food security aspect because Rangoon rice had been imported and also exported via Penang port to such a big extent. So the rice production does not does not aim, I think, for local consumption. So the existence of that massive uh, Sebrang Prai party land, uh, I have really to check out on where those rice go, but just to concur for that fact that Marcus, can I also like to ask you a little thing about the title of this book, Pastoral Pot? Uh, could you explain Pastoral there? Because I think rice can never be about security for my local perception. Marcus? <laughs> Well, I'm going to pass that pastoral report to you because that's your title. <laughs> I thought you wanted that title. <laughs> well, I suppose you, you fell for the alliteration for one second. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, and of course, it, it, does, it does say something about Penang and the nature of Penang and Penang's history. And of course, when generally when we talk about Penang, we think of the port. Mm. But here, the book is actually focusing beyond the port, right? Mm. And uh, I think the book does show how how central to Penang's history uh, the agrarian sector actually was, okay. not not for local consumption or substances, but like you rightly pointed out from with your first slide, mm. the difference between subsistence mentalities and and capitalism is mm. something else, right? So we, what you were showing in your in your talk was the coming of plantation systems after plantation systems, although relatively small, but they were significant one after the other, right? I, I would like in, in, the, in that line to ask you, by, by the middle of the 1800, I think, critical voices about environmental degradation was coming. I mean, they should live today and see what they, what they say. Uh, I think especially James Logan had already become critical of what was happening at the foothills of Penang and so on, right? Could you say something about that? Yes, I mean, it was, uh, Penangites were always very proud of the green hills as they still are today. And uh, there were many, many people who objected to the clearing of the hills. I mean, there were a lot of protests early in the day when, when uh, you know, hills started to become bare. And I, I, I think the nutmeg industry probably you know, being a big industry and an import, uh, export industry, uh, the money involved and everything else, it just kind of ran away with itself. And and uh, and with great alarm, people would look up and see their hills denuded. But you know, I've I have uh, a lot of old pictures from even the 1930s and so on, showing this this hill out here, this highlands as it originally was, or book at book at. Uh, Chandana, um, the whole of this side that faces the town was all all stripped bare, you know. So I mean, it's not that long ago that that all of this happened as well. But luckily, the 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 at least the pressure from uh, the social demand for for to preserve the environment has has been there all along, right from those early days, and and has resulted in it being preserved. And. And an agrarian um, economy will also immediately require water management, right? The question right. that that's important today. <laughs> yes, yes, of course. I mean, I, I, I wanted to pick up on that one, uh, Marcus. Um, in the uh, in the time that we have expanded agriculture 
in, in Penang. There must be some recurrent issues with respect to what is needed for a better uh, agriculture. Water is an issue. Has it always been an issue in uh, in Penang, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the plantations? I think uh, wa water is one thing that um, Penangites didn't really have to worry about, in, especially in those early days. I mean, we probably have to worry about it a lot more now because we have to feed all these giant condos, right? <laughs> Very hungry condos. Um, but in, in those earlier days, you know, I mean, Penang was still a very nice little vegetated area with lots of little houses and laneways and little coconut line and bamboo lined uh, laneways around the island. So it was a very nice uh, place with little bungalows all through the trees and so on. So I think uh, environmentally in that sense, um, the, the demand didn't outweigh the supply. You know, I think water's always been... Who, who knew that know, factories are thirstier than... Rice crops. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, any other question, please? Yes, sir. Yes, thank you very much for this overview of agricultural history and especially agricultural export. There is this saying, you who doesn't know history is bound to repeat it. So as you look back and see what has happened, what has worked, what hasn't worked for Penang today, what would you think are some of the lessons that we need to learn so that we do not repeat history? It's a good, it's a good question. Um, I, I think Penang itself has probably gone too far to be very agrarian anymore. Um, but of course, you know, personally, I would, I, I palm oil with, uh, <laughs> you know, a slightly dubious eye to, you know, such a huge, huge areas of, of monoculture is really not good for anybody, uh, except the growers. But uh, I, I, I think as far as lessons to be learned, I think Penang will move on to different sorts of lessons. I mean, even, even now, um, the Penang 2030 vision is really to move on and think of Penang in different terms, you know, so rather than uh, being a, you know, foreign worker reliant industry type place to, be, to, to, to capitalize on its own skills and build up a, a more technological base. Uh, so the whole agrarian face of, of Penang and Province Willisley or Seberang Prior now um, is changing. Uh, I think even the rice paddies are probably under some pressure. It's no longer who wants to who wants to do it. The young people don't want to be tied down growing rice, you know. So everybody's evolving, and and I think uh, the, the the real question is going to be where does it evolve to? You know, how does it evolve so that it still becomes a, a livable place and doesn't lose its character and and so on. So I, I think uh, as far as lessons go, I, I, I mean, humanity itself <laughs> needs to learn a lesson that you can't use up all your agricultural land because uh, that is your food bowl. I mean, China, why is China buying up half the world? You know, they know they're going to need those areas to feed their own people. You know, I mean, we need to avoid that sort of situation here. If I may add on to that, um, our agrarian past has now gone into aquaculture, really. Right? Uh, and Penang is one of the largest producers in that field. I think they're second, maybe only to Sabah. So, you know, we, we continue exploiting <laughs> where we can. Um, yeah. if, if I may add some, some information to that, uh, just as uh, if you look at the profile of Penang farmers, Penang farmers are the most educated in the country. Yes, uh, compared to the other uh, states. But uh, I, I was very proud until I looked at uh, the details of it. 70% uh, of Penang farmers uh, did not go beyond standard six. That's the most educated in the country. Uh, and uh, the rest uh, maybe another 
twenty uh, percent to form three, and less than two uh, percent goes to the universities. So when we are talking about uh, agriculture 4.0, Internet of Things for farmers, uh, you begin to think how much can be absorbed by the farmers. Uh, secondly, most of the farmers are uh, above 60. Is, is that all? Is that, I'm not sure. That's, 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 that's vintage. Yes. Uh, and, and given this profile, given this profile and, and the, the, the need for um, more efficient agriculture, uh, we have to uh, rethink uh, agriculture in Penang, especially for paddy. Uh, when climate change shows that the low-lying areas of Penang are going to be inundated um, by rising sea levels, and uh, and most of them, much of them, I think about 90% are paddy fields. So are we going to continue paddy, or have we uh, changed our, our diet? Uh, Indonesia is looking at sorghum. Uh, because they cannot grow paddy anymore. So I think this this is a very um, changing times. I think for for agriculture, it's the it's, challenge. It's a right. challenge. Yes. Right. We have five more minutes. Last chance. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for a very interesting. Uh, um, speak. Uh, I wanted to uh, go back to some of the history, uh, the, the, far, the first history of um, Penang's agriculture, um, of, the, of the consumption of pepper and nutmeg in uh, Europe. How large proportion did Penang actually uh, deliver in the, in the best times? Of, do I have some numbers of that? I guess. Um, yeah, I think that's a good question and um, a very hard one to answer because, uh, in fact, Penang's impact on Europe with pepper was negligible to nil, you know. I mean, mainly because they couldn't get it exported. You know, this was their big challenge. They couldn't. The East India Company didn't want to allocate ships to import Penang pepper. They seem to continue getting it from Sumatra and, and weren't really interested. So it, it, uh, in the in the 1820s, uh, Penang shipped quite a lot of pepper to China, black pepper to China, and white pepper, no doubt. Um, so it, it it sort of revived the industry at the time then. But as for a proportion, mm, be negligible in Europe and. Probably likewise the nutmeg. I mean, they, they certainly, I mean, what, 342 tons of nutmegs in, at its peak to, to Europe is probably still a fairly small quantity. And the Dutch were still producing and still exporting. So, uh, you know, but, you know, it's uh, in this little island, uh, it was a, a nice contribution and a, a, a probably a you know, a nice attempt to, to, to raise a, a, a revenue and find something. But the, the, I guess the, the rosy side of it is that uh, we tried to grow it. We couldn't sell it, but oh, it was really good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. Uh, to Tiger Bum, in a way. Precious. Can you use the price mic? Can you use the mic, please? The, the non-tech price just shoot out. So, but Penangese farmers, like any else, took the opportunity to grow that crop. And I think Penang will also buy because we always diversify. I'm the descendant of the Yap family who planted coconuts. Yeah? Right, right. Thank you. Thank you. I suppose that that's one good takeaway that just just from your talk itself, we do see how diversified over the 150 or 200 years the agricultural sector actually was in, in Penang. Perhaps a reflection of 
changing global demands and, and tastes. Of course. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a 230 years, a big, big time frame to try and cover in any kind of detail. So uh, a talk is kind of quite, quite a shallow overview of, uh, you know, agriculture. But um, the book has a, a bit more detail on all of these things. But of course, you could also write a very big fat book about all these products as well. Yeah, if enough of you buy this book, we might have part two. We're not sure yet. <laughs> I think we'll, we'll end there, but uh, Marcus will be around to put his mark on the book if you buy it today. Yeah, uh, 40 ringgit, uh, which is as cheap as you'll ever get it, right? So Marcus will be signing, I think. Yeah? But <laughs> thank, you, thank, thank him for, for his talk, and thank you, Prof. Zoom, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>